Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Ferguson, Missouri is a city of approximately 21,000 people located in North St. Louis County. It was incorporated as a city in 1894, but until August 9, 2014, few outside the St. Louis region had ever heard of it. On that day, Michael Brown was shot by police officer Darren Wilson. Since then, the eyes of the world have been on Ferguson. Our guest today is Ferguson's mayor, James Knowles III. When he was elected in April of 2011, he was the youngest mayor ever elected in Ferguson and one of the youngest mayors in Missouri. Uh, he and his city have been through a lot in the last three months. An extraordinary death, which sparked days of riots, followed by repeated demonstrations. And as of today, November 11, 2014, the threat of further riots. Mayor Knowles is here to discuss those events from his perspective. James Knowles, welcome the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, we were just saying before, and it's almost like a joke here, but you know, you're a big deal to come on this show, <laughs> and, and and you know, you don't see yourself as being a big deal at all. You know, you're just the same guy that you were, and also just so that nobody can say I didn't say it. You and I actually had known each other before this, and we've had several conversations uh, before before these events uh, of twenty uh, of August of twenty fourteen. I'm sure we'd never have thought back four years ago or eight years ago that any of those that we'd be in this position right now having no, this conversation. No, if you were coming here to talk, it would have been about you know politics, not about uh, uh, Ferguson and rioting. Um, if you had known in April of 2011 what was in store for you in August of 2014, would you still have uh, run for mayor? Absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, you've I done through, you and your town have been through a lot. We have, and uh, you know, I don't know about my my then girlfriend, now wife, <laughs> if she would have wanted to stick around. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, uh, I would have done it. You know, it's. It's important that we have uh, steady leadership to, to get us through these difficult times. Uh, three days after I was sworn in the first time, we had a tornado that came through, the Good Friday tornado of 2011, uh, you know, was devastating. Is this the, the one that hit the airport? Hit the airport, you know, bounced over, hit Berkeley, hit Ferguson, uh, Delwood, Moline Acres, kind of made its way across to the river again. Uh, that, you know, that was devastating to our community. It took months and months to clean up, bringing people together. Uh, our, our response was good, but you know, people just aren't really prepared for something like that. Two years later, in April 2013, we had another tornado come through, uh, slightly around the same time of the year, uh, slightly less destructive, but uh, we were able to respond even better and faster. Um, I would have thought at that point that our emergency preparedness was pretty good, uh, but nobody really expects you know the kind of uh, incident that we occurred in the following unrest, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, I've loved and lived in this community for 35 years, and um, I really believe that we have a lot of great people, a lot of great staff. Uh, they deserve to have the best services, and uh, you know it's my civic duty. I truly believe to to be a participant in that and lead if necessary, mm -hmm. which is what I stepped up to in 2011, and I wouldn't shy away from today. The Post Dispatch and other papers around the country have made. Um, a big deal about the, uh, the, uh, the mixture of people who live in your community. Uh, you're a white guy, mm -hmm. and most of your city council are white people. Mm -hmm. Your town is, according to the media reports, about 60 to 70 percent mm -hmm. African American. Okay. How is it that, uh, that you were elected mayor instead of someone out of the majority group? Well, I mean, no one out of the majority group ran, uh, number one, but uh, I would say, and if you look at uh, the transition of a lot of North, North County and just transition of a lot of cities that transition from uh, predominantly white to predominantly African-American, uh, there's, there's always a lag uh, in, when, in which you see African-Americans really step up to 
run for you know the majority of those offices and we've had several african americans over the past several years run uh, they won and served included in fact served served on the city council the we city have council. we have one uh now uh, mr james Dwayne james and then um when i was a city councilman uh uh, Mr. James Hines was our first African American, uh, and both you know both of those you know members of the council sought out uh, to to try to help and improve diversity. But it's not necessarily a job that everybody's you know stepping up to want to do. We had uh, well, wait. Just, let me ask you this: When you ran f to be an alderman mm -hmm. that election year, mm -hmm. what percentage of people voted? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean it, it would have been, 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 been about. I think. It was a mayoral election year too. I think it was uh, somewhere around the 17 percent. Um, because a big deal was made about well, only 12 percent of the of the electorate actually voted when you were elected. I guess what I'm saying is, isn't it normal for city elections to have uh, a really poor turnout? Yes, and, and that's unfortunate. I mean, there's just not as much excitement in, in serving on the city council. We had a we had somebody win by write-in a couple of years ago because nobody ran for the seat. So him and a few of his neighbors wrote their names down and he won. It's, it's not like anybody's being held back from serving. Uh, and like I said earlier, the, the two African-Americans that we've had on our council were, were sought out and recruited by the city to, to, to improve the participation levels. But you know, I've told many people, our, our, we have neighborhood associations, we have lots of neighborhood associations that the city help, helps fund. Um, most of them are run by African Americans. We have a lot of African Americans who are involved in our boards and commissions who attend our neighborhood meetings. So there is involvement. Um, I think there's a narrative that that some of the media wants to continue to drive a wedge as if there's some sort of a um, uh, effort to keep African Americans from getting involved, which is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I ran against a former. Where does mayor. that narrative come from? I mean, I mean, it, I think it, it comes it's from repeated. It comes from media who wants TV. to create an issue. Okay. I mean, it, I mean, I, I believe it's. And there are some from outside the community who see it and they draw a conclusion and they don't understand. They don't understand that Ferguson, not that long ago, was a predominantly white community. We're a community in transition, uh, but we're a community that uh, has always embraced and continues to embrace you know, integration of our community uh, to be a diverse community and not be a segregated community. There are communities in St. Louis uh, in the St. Louis area that are segregated. Ferguson is a very integrated community and some, there has been some uh, researchers who have come out and stated that and we've been appreciative because when you look at it by census tract, when you look at the, the neighborhoods, it is an integrated community. And up and until you know, the events of August, uh, we've not seen this kind of unrest or seen any kind of real division like this in the community, but this has clearly brought, you know, torn the scab off of many frustrations, many things that have been underlying in the in the community and in the St. Louis region and in the country for a long time. Now, in the meetings that you're having where you're not allowing the news cameras mm -hmm. to come in, can you describe what it is that your members of your community who show up at these meetings what what changes they want, what what's high on the agenda? Well, I think the biggest uh change is really just the relationship that uh the law enforcement has both with young people and in the african-american community and really just with the community in general because it's not something that people it's not something that just african-americans have complained about uh, it is really a, a situation where they they really want a community-oriented police department and how is that different than what existed on august the 8th well and those are those are conversations we're still having what does that look like because as a municipal police department as a smaller police department we've always been community-minded, um, but the level of interaction, uh, the level of uh, interaction that law enforcement has with, with citizens and especially young people, we're seeing from people that they want to increase that level of interaction, to increase more positive uh, interactions. Um, and so that's something that, that we're working on right now. A lot of that I think will be done in conjunction with the adoption of a civilian review board, which we've been uh, having meetings on and, and discussing uh, the task force will will be meeting tonight. Uh, our task force is made up of citizens, both citizens who have been longtime citizens, short-term residents, um, renters, homeowners, law enforcement officers are in this group. And we had our first meeting last week and there was broad consensus on how they wanted this this board to be formed and operated. Uh, as we continue to, as we as we put this board together and it starts to operate, we hope that that board is going to be the conduit for creating um, better understanding between law enforcement and, and the citizens. 
Do these people who were participating think that prior to the Michael Brown shooting that the police department in Ferguson was mean, deliberately mean to people or somehow were, were just acting in an obnoxious fashion deliberately? I wouldn't say that there's that there was there's people who have said that. I mean, but what I I wouldn't say that that was a majority statement by any stretch. Um, we we send out comment cards. One thing we did early on as well is we sent out comment cards to every household in the city, self-addressed stamped envelopes. They can send it back completely anonymous. We've gotten a ton of these back. Um, the vast majority have been very supportive of the city and the police department. Uh, and actually, black and white. Yes. Well, I would assume. I would. I mean, everybody. Well, that, had, well, everybody had. They are, right. They're right. anonymous. So and some people did sign their names, and and some people we do know who they came from because they 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 volunteered that information. Um, and, but even the residents who had criticisms, most of it was very constructive criticisms. I mean, there is there is non-constructive criticisms of the department right now out there that you hear, uh, and and that's being you know continue to be pushed by a lot of members of the media. But a lot of the, the criticism in the town halls, a lot of the criticism that we've gotten with those comment cards have been very constructive. They don't want to go to St. Louis County Police Department. They do not want to get rid of the Ferguson Police Department. They want to see things improved. Maybe they by and large like many officers in our department, but maybe that there's issues that they don't like. Uh, there's clearly issues that um, I think everybody can agree on, and even our own police officers can say that we could do better. And so that that criticism we're taking very seriously, and we hope that uh, we can proactively make make changes in our department before the Department of Justice comes back with any kind of uh, commentary on on their investigation of the department. Uh, and then we'll, you know going forward, the Civilian Review Board will again allow constant citizen input into the policies, procedures, and practices of the police department both giving that input to the police department, but also allowing the citizens to have a little bit better understanding of policing, how it's done and why. We've had a very active citizen police academy and a very active citizen uh, volunteer program with the police department for the past several years. Um, but, you know, I think this has brought to light in many people's mind who maybe weren't familiar with it before, uh, now that they, re they re now realize that, hey, there's, there's opportunities for us to learn a little bit more. There's opportunities for us to be involved in policing and the police matters. And so I think all of that going forward, a lot of it's just you know, education, letting people know what's out there and letting us know what we need to do. Uh, I think going forward, we're gonna see a much stronger city and a much stronger police department. One of the things that, excuse me, <clears throat> one of the things that angered people um, in the early days uh, on November, I'm sorry, on August the 9th, uh, the uh, encounter between police officer uh, Wilson and uh, Michael Brown occurred right around noontime on that Saturday. And um, the, uh, the body was in the street for some four hours. And this a lot of people took exception to. Um, I was looking up a timeline on this and uh, one of the things and you'll forgive me if I take a look at my sheet here, said that uh, the encounter occurred around 12.01 p.m. The shooting was reported around 12.07. There was a paramedic who was in the area that pronounced the uh, Michael Brown dead at 12.10. And then at 2.01, a fellow by the name of, uh, of uh, Calvin Whitaker was called. Can you just talk about Calvin Whitaker who was coming to pick up the body mm -hmm. and the sequence of events that leads to uh, the delivery at 437. Well, it's my understanding, uh, and I got this, of course, from, from some interviews that he had done, that uh, you know, he operates a livery service that uh, has a... Um, uh, he's a licensed mortician. Right, he's also a licensed mortician, and, he, and he's contracted with the St. Louis County Coroner, and uh, he was contacted, and it actually my understanding was he and his wife uh, actually had to respond and they responded to what was a very hostile area. And um, they were instructed by police to, to stay clear because there was shooting, because there was shots fired, because people were taking cover. The scene wasn't secure. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that added to what was already a, a very, um, you know, tragic situation that, that led to an unfortunate series of events with the investigation uh, with Mr. Brown's body being left in the street um, in plain sight at times. Um, you know, social media and other and, and other avenues have been able to 
you know, take all that information, take those, those gruesome pictures and spread it around. And of course that enraged people's senses. Um, and so uh, the media didn't help. Social media uh, really is what, what got this started at the beginning. And those, those pictures still continue to circulate and still continue to, to eat at people's um, emotions. And, and I can understand why, because it, uh, you know, it's, it's tragic to see that um, to see that replayed over and over again. Well, let me, uh, let me, I looked yesterday before doing this interview, because mm -hmm. I do research, I found an interview on the uh, KTVI Fox 2 uh, website uh, with John Persborn mm -hmm. interviewed uh, Mr. Whitaker on uh, September the 8th, the day, one day short of a month. And Mr. Whitaker was describing what was going on from his perspective uh, and he quote says we could not do our jobs it was unsafe police uh, told us to stay in our SUV and it and then he went on to say that it wasn't until the Michael Michael Brown's parents actually came out and asked the hostile crowd to back away to let these folks do their job they were in that vehicle according to Mr. Whitaker two hours so this could have been taken care of two hours earlier, according to Mr. Whitaker, but the crowd was there, it was hostile, there was shots were being fired, um, and they couldn't do their job for two hours. And yet I don't hear that being mentioned very often uh, in the media, and I didn't hear Chief Jackson during his apology mention that either. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are just not interested in hearing explanations. Um, Chief Jackson, uh, when he decided to to make an apology uh, regarding you know the situation that happened, did he discuss this with you beforehand? The apology, yes. yes. I mean, okay. it's something that we'd uh, discussed earlier. You know, it's an apology that he'd made, um, you know, directly, uh, expressed condolences directly to the family on the day of uh, the shooting. But um, it's very unfortunate that even though those facts that you laid out are are the facts of, of what happened. Um, it's not. It's not what a lot of people wanted to hear, and so. So Chief the Jackson, truth is inconvenient. Is that? Well, in some in some cases, yeah. I, I mean, the, the the truth that is the truth, and people don't want to. There's a lot of people that don't want to hear an explanation of what had happened. They just want to hear condolences. They want to hear uh, an apology. And the chief stepped up to to take full responsibility. He would have liked to have gotten the young man out of there much faster. Um, even the two hours, you know, the chief would like would like to have, you know, l kept the scene secure, and and had his body removed much sooner. But a lot of that was done. Uh, time was taken in the in the uh, hopes of making sure that the case was not tainted. That there was an absolute, uh, complete investigation of the facts of the scene itself of Mr. Brown's body. Um, and was so, that your officers that were doing the investigation no. at that point, or was that county? County, and that was one of the reasons why, again, there was yet, you know, yet a further delay. From the beginning, we wanted to do everything by the book. We wanted to make sure that there was no um, actions taken that people could say was some sort of impropriety or cover-up or whitewashing of, of what happened. So immediately we contacted St. Louis County. St. Louis County had to, on a Saturday, bring detectives out, get a crime scene team out there. All of that took time. All of that added to the delay. Uh, the scene was difficult to, to manage. It, it became increasingly difficult to manage while, while investigators were trying to measure, uh, photograph, and take, uh, uh, take down pertinent information as part of the investigation. All of that led to, the, to the, an extended time period, and then, even when, when uh, Mr. Whitaker got there um, to remove Mr. Brown, it, it, the scene became increasingly hostile led to an even longer time out there, which became a rallying cry to this day. Why did he stay out there for four and a half hours? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are, there's, there's clearly some that want to continue to, to uh, they don't want an answer, they want to continue this as a rallying cry. Um, I'm gonna mention a name to you, uh, Dorian Johnson. You know that name? I do. Who is that person? Uh, he's the young man that was with uh, Mr. Brown, um, uh, during the uh, during the incident, is he the one who um, 
initially stated to the, uh, I guess, to the press or to the police that um, uh, Michael Brown was running away and was shot in the back? My understanding, yes, that he was the, he was the one that made that initial um, claim. Because I looked up uh, Dorian Johnson, and uh, I mean, again, on the Channel 2 site, I believe also uh, the, the ABC affiliate, um, they also have uh, uh, some things about Dorian uh, Johnson as someone who has, who has, so I've read, lied to police, as a, a, an arrest record, is still under, I think uh, uh, there's an arrest warrant for him, I believe in Jefferson City, and yet people just take his word that this is how it happened? Well, other than uh, Darren Wilson, he's the only one that was immediately present at the event. And so um, those are really the only two sides, I think, that uh, were immediately present. And so uh, you know, his perspective, obviously, people are going to, going to listen to. Um, his credibility, uh, the credibility of either side is, you know, is what's up for debate, and, and I think that's a debate that people are going to continue to have. Well, luckily, there are other people that were there and actually saw what was going on. So media right. reports say, and these people... At varying have been, points, and, that's the, and I think that's also the point of the question as to how, mu how many people saw what at what point. And so at this moment, right now... Mm -hmm because the grand jury has not come back with a report, you, me, nobody in this room, nobody in the world actually, know, outside of the jury, the grand jury room, really know what happened there, do we? No, and you know, all of that's gonna to have to be corroborated with evidence. You know, physical evidence doesn't lie. Um, statements, um, and, and I know you had a, a criminal justice professor on as well, and, and I've heard this many a times, um, you know, statements from witnesses can be highly, um, uh, confused. Yeah, they they yeah. can be. They, they can, eyewitness testimony, yes, can can well, can yeah, vary and, widely. Yeah, and in in the the mind, you know, and I've heard many people say it, and and from my own um, from my own research on the issue, you know, where there's blanks in your memory, your mind tends to to fill them. And maybe Mr. Johnson actually saw it, or think thought he saw it the way that he's described it. Perhaps. I, right. I mean, people. Um, yeah, he's he's going to what he has in his mind. I mean, he either saw or he believes he saw, and um, and same with all the other witnesses. But what's what's going to be important is what from the physical evidence you can tie to the statements to corroborate those statements. That's the only way, short of having a video, that you're going to be able to tell what statements are true. Uh, or what statements are factually correct that haven't been maybe you know filled in by by your memory so uh, it's important that the physical evidence the evidence of of gunshot wounds placement of 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 uh, cartridges um, scratches scrapes all those things dna all of that's going to corroborate evidence and that's really going to paint the picture that of what actually happened I want to, in the last five minutes... And I don't know here, any of it at this point. Right. I'm just uh, saying. We, we got five minutes, sure. and I want to ask um, your, just your reaction to these various names. Antonio French, been helpful or not been helpful? Uh, I don't think he's been very helpful in the city of Ferguson. Um, I don't think he's been helpful at all. I'll leave it at that. The Reverend <laughs> Al Sharpton. Uh, there's been times where I thought he was going to be helpful. I don't know that he's been, been very helpful yet. He, he came in this last weekend, and he was supposed to call for peace and call for calm. And if he did, uh, the news didn't report that. So, Okay. Uh, Governor uh, Nixon? Uh, he hasn't been helpful at all yet. Uh, I mean, have you had a relationship with him? I mean, have, have you and he had any the only more than... I'm talking about an extended conversation, not just exchange of pleasantries. Uh, the only, the only, I wouldn't call it extended, but the only conversation that we had was in a group of other mayors um, after the event, and uh, yeah, that's the extent of it. Captain Ron Johnson. I've had no real conversations with Captain Ron Johnson, just a few pleasantries. Do you feel that uh, his taking command of the situation was helpful? I honestly think that the um, constant turmoil in command was as part of the problem early on. There wasn't a steady response. Um, there was back and forth as to who's in charge. 
uh, what the rules of engagement are, uh, what the stance of the policing. It was changing, you know, every couple of days. And so um, that's difficult for residents to feel comfortable with as far as whether their safety and security is being protected. And that's difficult for protesters who, who don't know at this point what the rules are. Um, and so it is, I think that's that lack of communication, that confusion, even within the command, I think, uh, was very detrimental early on. Um, how did you feel about when uh, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder came to town? Was that helpful? Um, I don't know that it's been helpful or hurtful yet. Uh, I think it was, it's frustrating to me that he did not uh, want to have a conversation with me or anybody from the city of Ferguson. Uh, he came did to you the, ask? He came to the Florissant Valley, uh, Florissant Valley Community College. Uh, I was invited to the event, and then I was, uh, that invitation was, was um, retracted, so at his request. So. That's interesting. And President uh, Obama's comments? Uh, I really haven't heard many comments from President Obama. I do appreciate that he has not, uh, uh, at least that I've seen so far, I have not seen anything from him in which he's made uh, some predeterminations as, as so far as Eric Holder has. And Eric Holder, even while investigations from the Justice Department, Justice Department are ongoing, uh, continues to make conversation or continues to have conversations and continue to make statements that are. Um, uh, make it seem like there's already a decision made about the city of Ferguson and, the, and its police department. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I think they've been absolutely, <laughs> I, think, I think they as well as many other media outlets have helped create as many problems as they've helped fix. As we sit here right now on uh, Veterans Day, November 11th, with the decision from the grand jury getting ready to come down maybe in a couple of days, maybe another week, maybe longer, do you feel that the media has created an environment in which it's almost like we're rooting and it's a sports event? You know, the national media, I, I do see that. I do see that especially from the national media. It, you know, for them, this is until something else comes up that's going to get someone to turn on the TV to the to the 24-hour news, it seems that this is what they're focused on. Uh, and that's that's very frustrating. They have not been interested in telling the, the true stories about what's happening in the lives of, of law enforcement officers or our citizens, the average everyday citizen uh, who's just trying to, to go on with their life. Uh, or, you know, again, the elected officials and what we're actually been doing, the, the reforms we've been making to try and work with with people who have concerns, so those are all, uh, yeah. I, I don't see anything that the media is doing that, that is helpful. Thank you very much. All we right. appreciate your candor here today, and uh, I know it's only a half hour. I wish that we had an hour to talk about this, but we really appreciate your coming in here today. And to my audience, I've been speaking with the mayor of Ferguson, Missouri. You know that place. This is going to be uploaded to YouTube. You can tell your friends about it and go look. To the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.